This is KVR, Kaiju Vision Radio, Episode 39, The Mysterians. Hello Kaiju and Tokusatsu fans and welcome to Kaiju Vision Radio, a podcast about the appreciation of Kaiju and Tokusatsu movies and discovering their historical and cultural value. I'm Brian Scherchel. Just one quick show-related piece of info to get through before I start to appreciate this very special film. This feature has been around a while uh, in the uh, podcast episode notes, but there are timestamps, and uh, you'll notice them in the episode notes on uh, podcast websites and also in the YouTube notes. And uh, it shows where the part one, part two, and part three intro and conclusion uh, begin and end in the the episode. And so you're able to, uh, in the case of YouTube, you can just click on the timestamps in order to surf around there. Uh, And if you go to the episode notes on uh, any of the podcast websites, uh, you can just drag the uh, little uh, meter over to the timestamp that's appropriate. And that way you have the freedom to navigate around in these episodes. And it's been a feature for a long time, but it's something that I wanted to make sure that everyone knows is available. And with that, let's get this show on the road. In this episode, I will be covering the 1957 film, The Mysterians. It's a much more significant movie than Half Human, which is what I uh, covered last time. The related topic for this episode is the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and the Soviet Union. A short description of the film is next. It's the original method used to give the listeners the facts about the film while avoiding boring plot synopsis that can be easily retrieved from a wiki site. You're listening to KBR, Kaiju Vision Radio. The Mysterians are a technologically advanced alien race. They're formerly of the planet Mysteroid, which used to be the fifth planet from the sun until it was destroyed in a nuclear war. Their goals are to use their technological superiority to occupy and defend land on Earth and to breed with Earth's women in order to replenish their population and their radioactively damaged genetics. Mogura is a Mysterian-controlled mecha kaiju that can burrow and dig underground. It emits intense heat and can shoot destructive laser beams. The Mysterians possess at least two of these. The bright and talented astrophysicist Ryoichi Shiraishi is intensely dedicated to science above all else, which causes him to become enamored with the highly technological Mysterians when they arrive. His friend Joji Atsumi is a resourceful and heroic man whose primary drive is to resist and defeat the Mysterians. Ryoichi's ex fiance Hiroko Iwamoto and his sister Etsuko are attractive women who mainly want to protect their friends and family. They want to avoid reproductive relationships with the aliens. Dr. Tanjiro Adachi is a smart, moral, and resolute leading scientist whose primary goal is to repel the invaders. The plot is unified because everything in the story, including the human drama, has to do with the Mysterians. The Mysterians are the problem. The first Mogura is destroyed after it falls when the JSDF destroys the Koyama Bridge. The military attack against the Mysterians fails because they are outmatched technologically. The Earth Defense Force builds two airships, Alpha and Beta, to attack the Mysterians' dome, but using only those airships fails too. Then Dr. DeGracia develops a lens weapon called the Markalite FOPS, or Flying Atomic Heat Projector, to reflect the beam that the dome fires. The second Mogura is destroyed when a Markalite cannon falls on top of it. The problem is solved when Shiraishi and Atsumi destroy the base from the inside while the Markalite cannons destroy the dome. Atsumi rescues the captive women, and the Mysterians withdraw from Earth. The story, by Jojiro Okami, based on an adaptation by Shigeru Koyama, and the screenplay by Takeshi Kimura, is simple, yet the methods used to repel the invaders are complex. 
There are a few main characters, while there are quite a few supporting human characters collectively working to get rid of the Mysterians. The subplot is Shiraishi and his reasoning for collaborating with and then rejecting the Mysterians. The budget of the film is unavailable, but you can tell the production value is quite high. The impressive special effects, managed by Eiji Tsuburaya, were a significant step up from any other tokusatsu film up to this one. This was the first Toho scope slash widescreen movie Toho produced, as well as the first Toho film to use perspective stereophonic sound. Toho scope, like CinemaScope and early Panavision, has a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio of 35mm film. Especially notable aspects of the production are the extensive use of superimposition, models and murals, high use of extras, heavy collaboration with the JSDF, and overall high attention to detail. They used an optical printer to achieve these effects, and the rays from the Markalite Fops, for instance, were actually drawn by hand onto the film. Mogira, derived from the Japanese word for mole, was designed by Ishiro Honda, Takeshi Kimura, and Shigeru Komatsuzaki. It was originally conceived as an animal kaiju similar to an actual mole, but it was changed to a piece of technology in order to better fit with the Mysterian's high-tech culture. The music by Ikafube is one of his absolute best works. The tone of the movie is serious, and the story has enough gravity while not making the film seem heavy. The movie features extensive sci-fi trappings, aliens, and their high-tech weapons, so this is a fantasy film. The Mysterians is an experimental film because it's the first alien invasion story, the first tokusatsu film with a mecha, the first to feature an Earth defense force, and it's much more of a sci-fi film than a kaiju film. The Mysterians is an expansion of style for Toho Tokusatsu because of its sci-fi emphasis, its technological achievements, and its many firsts, particularly the alien invasion story, which is used in a number of later Toho films. Toho wanted to create an original sci-fi movie following in the tradition of sci-fi movies like Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, Forbidden Planet, and many others. It was meant to attract an audience interested in those and other sci-fi and kaiju movies. The film was released on December 28, 1957. The literal translation of the title is Earth Defense Force. It was a major hit, making 193 million yen, or about $3,880,000 at the box office. Of the films produced by Toho in 1957, this was its second highest earner. Ishiro Honda stated that this was his favorite film that he ever directed. The rights to distribute the film to Southeast Asia sold at a higher price than any Japanese film before it. It was released in the United States by RKO Radio Pictures, and then MGM, on May 15, 1959, and then re-released on July 1, 1959. MGM made $58,000 in American ticket sales. American critics didn't treat the movie very kindly, criticizing the plot and the level of color saturation, but praising the special effects. It is beloved by fans for its effects, story, music, and originality. The film is rated 6.3 on that movie database. Unlike many Japanese tokusatsu movies released up to this point, this one was not significantly altered. The main difference between the original version and the American English dub is about three minutes of editing. At the very end of the movie, Atsumi says that a satellite was launched that will protect us from Mysterian invasion. Right before that, in the Japanese version, a craft is shown launching from the ground. In the English version, the final Mysterian UFO leaving Earth is shown instead. There are many forces at play in this film. The humans collaborate as individuals to accomplish tasks, while the Mysterians have a single totalitarian leader and work in a hierarchical system. The Mysterians are more eager to use nuclear weapons to resolve disputes, while humanity decides not to use nuclear weapons and instead uses smarter methods to repel the invasion. One theme of the movie is that Earth cannot let a nuclear war happen because it would repeat the tragedy of the Mysterians. Coupled with this is a broader theme that science should be used for the benefit of humanity and not used in evil, destructive ways. Ishiro Hana's often used Brotherhood of Man theme is expertly applied in the story, showing a formerly divided humanity coming together as Earthlings to defend themselves against hostile outsiders. That concludes Part 1. You're listening to KVR, Kaiju Vision Radio. 
Part two of the podcast is the opinion and analysis section. Wow, this is a fantastic film. It is quintessential tokusatsu. Needless to say, I absolutely love it. And many people do, and you can obviously tell why. This is just beautiful and high quality from the beginning, artistically, and it's an amazing movie. There are a whole lot of extras, big crowds of them, and there are so many scenes that have so many people in them. There are a lot of women in the scene, for instance, where we're shown the sort of harem that they're now a part of uh, inside the Mysterian base. I first saw this movie a couple of years ago uh, when researching all of these Toho movies, but I have seen this now so many times that uh, I feel like I know it front to back. The Mysterians is easy to rewatch. I would introduce tokusatsu newbies to this movie because of its high quality and its slick, classic sci-fi atmosphere. It's an easy movie to put myself inside of as well. With widescreen, you have to get a lot of stuff to fill the screen because it's so big. And it's more work as a result. It's more work and it's more money. I highly recommend seeing the original Japanese version of this and not some dubbed and or a pan and scan version. Uh, that's, but that's what we've been recommending since episode one of this show. Overall, there is a great amount of care that went into this film, and you can tell it's polished. There are a lot of matte paintings and superimposing of effects and landscape. There's so much detail. Everything down to the wires on the electrical poles and the radio-controlled tanks is just great. The music is creepy and menacing, sort of heavy. It's one of my favorite Ikufube soundtracks. The background music when they're investigating the village, for instance, was just perfect. Let's get into the story now. Even before the Mysterians' uh, beginning of their invasion, Akihiko Hirata's character, Ryoichi Shireishi, was out of it mentally. He broke his engagement, and of course later in this film, he ends up supporting aliens who want to procreate with the woman that he broke up with. He's almost an alien to other people in this movie. If science was a drug, he'd be a junkie. Now, Kenji Sahara, who played Shigeru in Rodan only the year before this, is the main character, and I really like him in this. The main character would have been played by Yoshio Tsuchiya. However, he gave up that lead role because he wanted to be the leader of the Mysterians that badly. The movie also stars Momoko Kochi, who was, of course, Emiko Yamane in the original Godzilla. Takashi Shimura is also from uh, the first Godzilla movie, and he is again in this. And I don't do biographies of all these people on the show. I'm trying to concentrate in the movie, but these are some of the biggest people. However, Takashi Shimura is one of my favorite Japanese actors ever. I don't demand that action starts off in a movie by any means at the beginning, but starting the story with this dramatic forest fire was just great. The matte painting at the beginning of the fire is just beautiful. The fire starts really close to the beginning. The underground installation is being established, and the fire is coming up from the roots. Now, that's just a really cool image to even think about, let alone uh, see graphically on the screen. Towards the beginning of the movie, the whole village is destroyed by a landslide slash earthquake, and it also turns out that it's a little bit radioactive, even. The destruction scene of that village is beautiful. The Tori Gate being destroyed is of cultural significance because they are considered sacred. Now, I would consider that Mogura is the one that uh, did all of this destruction. We then see mysterious dead fish in the stream, and then all, all these odd occurrences are piling up. But then, bam, we get more action with the first ever robot in Toho sci-fi. Tomoyuki Tanaka insisted on having Mogura in the movie. Now, that's going to be a huge long pattern with uh, this season on the show. He uh, insists a lot of kaiju be in these movies. Of course, that's Hiro Nakajima in the suit, and, and it is samurai warrior sort of armor that's on it. Seeing a metal samurai costume also reminded me of Terry Gilliam's Brazil with the samurai warrior robot. We mentioned in the Space Godzilla episode that Mogura just walks around and beeps, but it does blow up stuff too. It does quite a few things, and I really like it. For a while, Mogura's presence in the Godzilla video game confused me. 
And it isn't just because it technically wasn't a Godzilla movie that Mogura first appeared in, as was the same with Baragon, until uh, GMK came out. The shots of the real JSDF in this movie get reused so many times in future movies. The flamethrowers that they use in this movie are absolutely just fun and amazing. This is one of the movies that had the most JSDF cooperation of any movie in the Showa Godzilla era. The JSDF worked extensively with Toho on this movie, and they worked less with Toho in Tokusatsu movies less and less gradually after this. Now, I wouldn't want to be in the bathtub and see Mogra outside my window. It makes me think of the original Rampage video game, uh, where they're uh, smashing the skyscrapers, you know, and then there's like this woman that's in the bathtub. <sighs> the ray that Mogra shoots would uh, probably scare me more than the giant-like qualities even, just because it probably really hurts. I have to say that them building a smaller scale bridge across the actual river and blowing it up is so meticulous. I almost feel like this is a reference to the bridge on the river Kwai, which uh, this was in the same year. Uh, it was released on October 2nd of 1957. The Mysterians building a base on the dark side of the moon is a great idea. It's sort of in your neighborhood, but out of sight. Very uh, duplicitous. And considering the moon was Theia and it had crashed into us, and that's pretty cool. I don't know if people really think of the moon as something that crashed into us a long, long time ago. The effects on this movie were just crazy, and the special effects people and everybody else that worked on this film really put extra effort into this. The set was so hot that sweat evaporated from them instantly. When they sweat, this was one of the most intense sacrifices for the art that I may have ever seen. This movie does have heavy basis in Forbidden Planet from 1956, which is, is an expensive film. I absolutely love the thematic elements of the story of Forbidden Planet. This movie was groundbreaking. Not only did it depict humans using faster-than-light travel for the very first time, but the entire story took place in interstellar space, also a first, and it was the first science fiction movie ever produced by MGM. It was in color, which was rare for an American sci-fi film, and it had an electronic music soundtrack. It's a fantastic movie. The alien race on the planet perished overnight because they activated an extremely powerful machine to magnify their intellectual powers. Their downfall was that the monsters from their id were also given limitless powers. So it was their subconscious that foiled them. When I heard that, I thought, oh, so they created the internet? A lot of people's ids get magnified on the internet, so that makes, kind of makes sense. But the limitless power that's talked about in this movie is what? Nuclear energy. The Mysterians went to nuclear war and ended up nearly destroying themselves. As advanced as they were, they were obviously not ready for this technology. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come to Earth barely able to survive. For you Mystery Science Theater fans, there's another movie that I thought of when watching The Mysterians, and that is Terror from the Year 5000. That movie was released in 1958, and it is about an Earth woman from the year 5000 who is brought to the present day. Earth from the year 5000 is overly irradiated and has deformed ecosphere and inhabitants. So the implication is that no one did enough in the 20th century to stop the apocalypse, and therefore everyone in the future suffers. It's one of my favorite episodes of the show ever, by the way. My favorite riff from that episode is Swimming Bonnet from Amish Beachwear Fashions of Charm, Ohio. I laugh hysterically every time when I hear that joke. Scientists are a big deal, and they're heroes in their own right in this movie. It's Takashi Shimura as Dr. Adachi who releases the information that there's an invasion going on. He alone makes that decision. And it's scientists that the Mysterians want to talk to. The scientists are ambassadors for the people, too. Dr. Adachi says, I'll take care of it when the Mysterians first appear. Okay, what's he going to do? They sort of put the SDF in their place, although the SDF's job is to protect these guys. Then one of the other scientists says, oh, they won't be harmed. Well, what gives him that idea? The huge destructive robot that vaporizes people? Uh, the scientists are effectively in command of many aspects of the counterattack, arguably putting themselves in harm's way. Dr. Adachi 
uh, when he's uh, doing his little address, it sounds like he's a Japanese Winston Churchill. It's like, this invasion must be defeated for the sake of the entire planet. But that's how powerful scientists are in this. As a side note, at the meeting that he has with the Mysterians, he's dressed in this white suit. There's a joke from that movie, Laughter on the 23rd Floor, where this comedian sees a fellow comedian who's wearing a white suit, and he says, you look like the governor of Devil's Island. And that's a reference to Hell on Devil's Island, another 1957 movie. That shot of the scientists from behind as they walk towards the dome for the first time made me want to sing We're Off to See the Wizard as the characters in that movie skipped towards the Emerald City. Anyway, that matte painting of Mount Fuji is absolutely incredible. So we have an enemy that's coming in as friends. They're saying they want peace and they want just a tiny bit of land, so small. Then they try to take over everything. This story is also about mistrusting outsiders as well. So about the anti-nuclear themes, the Mysterians suffered nuclear war and now they can't even barely breed, they need fresh genes, deleterious genetic damage was the term we ran into when we did the episode on Godzilla vs. Megalon about atmospheric nuclear testing. That movie actually alludes to underground nuclear testing. Immediately, the scientists say how the Mysterians are immoral with their attacks on Earth. Uh, the Mysterians don't really care about this. The Mysterians' complaint about humans selling land at random on Mars is pretty funny, and it's not really surprising either. They view women as breeding vessels, essentially. Once this is mentioned, that's when the scientists get really concerned. They already even picked out the first batch of women. The story ties in to what happened to the asteroid belt, and what it was like before. If there were people on uh, the supposed planet before it broke up, what would have happened to, to cause that, and what would they do once that did happen? The warble of the talking of the Mysterians is very nice, the translation device and everything. The inside of the base is amazing, too, with the neon lights. The set is just utterly fantastic. Regarding the colors of the uncomfortable fiberglass uniforms that the Mysterians wear, obviously the red shirt is in charge of their organization, and yellow and blue are below that. So the Mysterians say, call off the military. Then there will be peace, we're pacifists, etc. All lies. It's not even a meeting that these scientists go to when they meet the Mysterians. It's more of just, just a list of demands. No questions allowed. And by the way, we want the women in this photograph, who all happen to be women who are in your lives. Meeting adjourned. I like the next scene where everybody decides, virtually unanimously, that the Mysterians are a bunch of dictatorial jerks and we're going to take them out. Nobody's even second-guessing this decision. The thing about the women was probably the deal-breaker, right? I can't help but think that these Mysterians, it sort of reminds me of the Borg from Star Trek when I think about the way that the Mysterians work. They are very hierarchical and uh, they may as well be telling the world resistance is futile. They also try to join uh, genetically with humans, which that's kind of what the Borg do, is they assimilate things. One of the most interesting scenes in this entire movie is when Kenji Sahara's character, Gyoji, he goes in and he tells Yumi and Hiroko that they are on the list. And they're like, what? come on, don't tease, or kind of another way of saying, oh, come on, shut up, it's not funny. And then he says, no, really, you're on the list, but don't worry, the police are going to guard you. It's okay. <laughs> That's got to be one of the absolute number one things that women would never want to be told by someone. Yes, there are aliens invading Earth, but honey, there's something else. The aliens want to breed with Earth's women, and you're going to be in the very first group. Oh, and did I mention that they're radioactive? Then Shiraishi, who is Harada's character, he says, don't attack. Don't attack the Mysterians. He uses the Japan and U.S. comparison to say that the Mysterians are the new U.S. in that comparison. He seems hypnotized by their technological superiority. He's practically worshipping science. Out of control he is. He's Mr. Appeasement on the land issue, too. And of course the movie's saying here that science can be destructive, too. And he's essentially a little quizzling, and he's acting as a prophet of surrender for the aliens. The military-only option fails. And of course, check our Shin Godzilla episode for more on this phenomenon. 
It looks incredible, though. The men in the top of the tanks, the beautiful effects of the dome taking all of the ineffective direct hits, the melting of the radar dishes and the tanks, and the smoke from the explosions looks really nice. 43 to 44 minutes into the movie, during the JASDF attack on the base, there's a marvelous POV shot of one of the planes closing in and firing on the base. I had to go back and see that twice. There's a POV shot from a tank, too, which is great. The detail of the planes blowing up looks great as well. That tank getting taken out by the ground, caving in under it, looks very nice. So well filmed. And the little man in the tank even jumps out of the tank. That's as convincing as you can make that look. It's mentioned that the base has the destructive power of the Japanese earthquake of 1923, which was the Kanto earthquake. The Mysterians are bringing out their propaganda about peace directly to the people, which is manipulative. They're bringing the UFOs over cities and doing their little loudspeaker routine. They're going to the public saying, we don't like war, when in fact their plans are to take over Earth. There's a common enemy for the U.S. and the Soviet Union and the rest of the world now, and it's a rare opportunity for cooperation. The fact that everyone unites makes me almost wish this kind of thing would happen, this is probably what it would take, though, to be uh, an invasion. Maybe not even that. Hypocrisy abounds regarding the alien statement of we will only use force if we're attacked, yet they are invading, which is an attack. Inside the Mysterians' base, the tall tunnel with the elevators is strikingly similar to Forbidden Planet. They had to have watched this movie before making this. This is definitely an era where people had more faith in the United Nations. And then we get our montage of the cars dropping off world leaders, which reminded me of the return of Godzilla from 1984. 51 minutes in, we have our wonderful English-speaking actors who show up later in other Toho movies. The international flavor is just fantastic. We even have one of the English speakers piloting one of the UN ships later. A little bit more about our English-speaking actors. The first one I'll mention is Harold Conway, the guy with the mustache, he plays Dr. de Gracia, who is the inventor of the Markelite Fops. He was in Mothra from 1961, and he had lines in other versions of Godzilla vs. The Thing, and he was in Invasion of the Neptune Men, which is a huge MST3K-related favorite of mine. He was the Relizican ambassador in Mothra, by the way. His actual job was a tax accountant. The other English-speaking actor is George Furness, he plays Dr. Svensson. He's a former soldier and was a lawyer for Mamaro Shigemitsu and for Admiral Soemu Toyota, uh, who, and they were both represented in the Tokyo trials for war crimes. The Soviet Union really wanted Shigemitsu, and his lower level of sentence was attributed to Furness's defense of him. George Furness was also in Gorath, which is another movie that Kaiju Vision Radio will be covering. At 57 minutes in, we get a few very nice murals and a bunch of nice shots of our new vehicle. The airships, which are the UN Earth Defense Force vessels uh, that fly around, they're interesting in maybe the greatest possible ways. They're very nice looking and more believable than these contraptions from the 80s and 90s, the Super X, Super X2 and all that stuff. I would proudly own one of these ships. I'd take that with me to the lake on the weekends. They're maybe my favorite human-made vehicles, aside from the wonderful Etragon style vessels. The whole World Air Force concept is just great, too. At the end of the movie, this ship is just picking off those UFOs one by one as they're trying to escape. The Japanese really have an obsession with the uh, airship thing, and I can't help but notice that uh, if, once you've seen enough tokusatsu. After our battle with the World Air Force, an argument ensues about whether to use nukes against the Mysterians or not. You know, we have the whole, it's the only way, versus we can't do it, that would kill us too. The ending battle is huge. As pacifist as Honda is, if there's no reasoning with the invaders, you have to take care of it. Also, a 75-mile radius around Mount Fuji is a really big area to evacuate, I checked. It includes the vast majority of the Tokyo metropolitan area. The music and the effects of the initial landing of the Markelite Fops is really effective and exciting. 
The delivery system is nicely designed with rockets and everything. The effects of the flying saucers going underwater is also very pretty. There are quite a few moments that you just want to press the rewind button to see something like that again. Another moment is the wonderful flood scene. It's beautiful, and it's hitting the village. It looks so organic. It's one of the best flood scenes ever in any Toho Tokusatsu movie from this era. The ending of the movie, there's this wonderful sunset, and it's just this strikingly beautiful uh, matte painting. It's just, the matte paintings in this are just fabulous looking. One of the few things in this movie that I found genuinely funny was the lens dish falling on the second Mogra towards the end and destroying it. The satellite at the very end, in the middle of the screen, it looks a whole lot like Sputnik. Uh, that was launched on October 4th, 1957, and that was when the satellite started the whole Sputnik crisis. Now, this movie was released on December 28th, 1957, and also the head of the Mysterian says that Earth has launched satellites. So this is a very interesting coincidence uh, time-wise with the fact that uh, everybody knew that scientists were eventually going to be launching uh, satellites, just nobody knew who was going to be doing it first. Another th interesting thing related possibly to the Soviets is the part about how the invaders just ask for a small area of land of their own, and then later on, it's clear that their intentions are that they're going to take much more than that. And there could be a connection with that because of the Kuril Islands that the Soviet Union had invaded towards the end of the Great Pacific War. And it was a genuine possibility that the Soviets could build bases on the Kuril Islands. This movie makes a relatively big point about collaborators, and this could reference many of the situations in World War II with collaborators. The Cold War was more about defectors. The movie is immersed in the Cold War era, and how Honda didn't really agree on the whole East-West division, and he's actually trying to reverse this dynamic. And the implication is, is that Japan, with its rejoining the international community, can lead the world in accomplishing peace. There's obviously a thread in this film about coping with invasion. The fact that Japan suffered its own invasion only 12 years before this, and that it was the only invasion and surrender that Japan had ever gone through. Thankfully, the film doesn't significantly dwell on this, but there's enough that's been said. Overall, this movie is so easy to enjoy. The effects are cinematic eye candy. There's enough action, but there's still enough going on with the story to make a big impression. It's a very fun film. Show it to your friends. Show it to your family. It's, it's just fun. This is just a great, fun film. And while a lot of it's serious and there isn't really much stuff in it that's funny, it's still really entertaining. That concludes the opinion and analysis section, and now I will move on to related topics. You're listening to KVR, Kaiju Vision Radio. In part three of the podcast, I will be analyzing a topic that was either brought up in the film or was going on at the time of the film's release. And for this episode, I chose the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and the Soviet Union. I chose this topic because Japan finally was able to join the UN after the Soviet Union stopped blocking this from happening. This was all going on in Japan at the time the movie was released. The Diplomatic Relations Agreement was signed on October 19th of 1956. The Mysterians debuted in Japan on December 28th, 1957, as part of the 1957-1958 New Year's celebration. And a huge part of this movie is what Japan does once it rejoins the international community. And in this, it not only helps the international community, but Japan actually takes a leading role. And this kind of a role is something that Japan really coveted after the war and once it regained its independence. Japan probably felt that they needed to prove themselves and once again show their leadership as well as be part of an international community that accepts them again. Next, I will bring us up to date on the specific information regarding Russia slash Soviet Union and Japan before 1956. Even before Commodore Perry, Russia had tried to open up Japan commercially before and failed. 
When Japan emerged from its isolationist period, when Commodore Perry went into Tokyo Bay, Perry figured that there would be competition for Japan between the U.S. and Russia, and he was right. There's a difference between how the end of World War II is taught here in America versus how things actually played out. Now, we're taught that the atomic bombings subdued Japan into surrendering to the U.S. While that was a factor, Japan surrendered to the U.S. because the Soviet Union was in the process of invading Japan from the north. Japan knew that the Soviet Union would not give back the land and that the United States was a much more preferable country to surrender yourself to. Now, put yourself in their position. Everybody knows that the Soviet Union would not have given back anything that they had taken, and that if, if you're being invaded by the Soviet Union and another country at the same time, you're going to surrender to that other country. Because which choice would you have made, knowing what typically happened to countries that the Soviets invaded? We would have had a Japanese Soviet Socialist Republic. That's hard to imagine. And Japan would not be what it is now, if that was the case. Distance can be good or bad uh, between Russia and Japan, but the close proximity made things worse between them, as Russia was an obstacle to Japan for invading China. After Japan beat Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, Russia had to get along with Japan and enacted a policy of appeasement. Once communism became a dominant force in Russia, Japan did not like it. The Soviets immediately started trying to undermine the emperor. In 1941, the two countries signed a neutrality pact to stop the Soviets from having a two-front war, once German invasion of the Soviet Union was imminent. Japan didn't want to have Russia attack them at home or in China, and Russia wanted to avoid an attack from Japan in the east. With the Soviet invasion of the northern part of Japan, it was quite possible that a shared arrangement between the U.S. and the USSR could have happened, much like in Germany with West Germany and East Germany. The U.S. was able to get Soviet help in defeating Japan by promising some land in the contested islands in the areas of northern Japan. Later, the Soviet Union told Japan that they'd have to give up a great deal for them to remain neutral. Too much, in fact. Japan considered the Soviet Union's last-minute attack on Japan as a huge betrayal. Hokkaido was far too important to the U.S. to let it fall to Soviet control. The Soviets wanted to occupy Hokkaido. The Soviets ended up taking Sakhalin and all of the Kuriles. But if they had occupied Hokkaido and given it back in 1992, the economic damage from that long of an occupation would have lasted centuries. Secretary Stimson, who was the Secretary of War during World War II, made sure that Kyoto was off the atomic bombing lists because it would have made Japan angry forever. The U.S. always had in mind that Japan would be important to protect from the Soviet Union. Then the Soviet Union invaded Manchuria, and Japan wanted to surrender to the U.S. Then the U.S. shut the Soviet Union out of business with Japan for the most part. The Soviet Union then realized the possibility of a Japan that was hostile to them. Then there was a period discussed in episodes 3 or 4 of this podcast, the start of the U.S. occupation, which was very different than what it was by the end. In the beginning, the U.S. was promoting democracy and letting communists out of prison. By the end, the U.S. was primarily concerned with the Cold War, which has started. It's a case of differing priorities pro-democracy, followed by anti-communism. The Korean War changed a lot of why this was happening. This is so fascinating to research and discuss. I love history. The Soviets wanted to use the Japanese Communist Party to go against the Emperor and the United States. The Soviets directly controlled the Japanese Communist Party for much of its existence. The Soviets were taking the Japanese through the process of indoctrination as well in the areas that the Soviets occupied so that they could come home to Japan and spread communism. But the Soviet Union and communism in Japan were still really unpopular. It was a bad PR campaign by, on behalf of the Soviets. Because of the threat of the Soviet Union, China, and Australia, who wanted the emperor to go be, and be uh, tried for war crimes, and then they have the monarchy abolished, 
the U.S. and Japan instead drafted the new Japanese constitution. MacArthur was for the emperor remaining in power. And the constitution was written mostly by the United States. There were some governing bodies regarding a post-war Japan that other countries were members of, but the U.S. found every possible way to subvert or ignore them so that Japan would retain the emperor and the Soviet Union would be excluded as much as possible. The Soviets got angrier as the time went on and, and because they knew a revived Japan could be a strong ally for the United States. The Japanese wanted American protection from the Soviet Union because the Japanese didn't believe that the UN could protect them from the Soviets. Japan got more concessions out of the U.S. because the U.S. was eager to beat the Soviet Union in the region. The Soviet Union was, of course, against the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, and they boycotted the signing of the Treaty of San Francisco. The U.S. would have to consent to any other military bases of other countries being allowed in Japan as well. And that was part of the security treaty. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union tried to exploit sentiment in many countries all over the world that American alliances meant a nuclear war. Then the Japanese government told the Soviet mission to, of Japan to get out. Now, this is all the diplomatic people. And then Russian diplomatic efforts had to find whatever avenue they could to get their message to Japan. The Soviet Union said that Japan must expel American troops in order to solve its differences with the Soviet Union, and that was their ultimate goal. When Yoshida left the PM position and Hatoyama became the new PM, Hatoyama tried to have Japan be more independent. The Soviets were the first ones to make the move to start talks. The talks revolved around a number of issues. Which islands in northern Japan would belong to which country? This involves the Kuril Islands as well as others. The Soviet Union allowing Japan to enter the United Nations was another issue. The Soviet Union held this allowance of Japan into the UN as hostage, effectively, pending diplomatic relations. Another issue was claims for damages and reparations from the war. Another issue was ending hostilities formally between the two countries and also fishing rights and trade, and repatriation of Japanese into Japan who from those Soviet-held areas. The Soviets initially said that Japan must dissolve its alliance with the U.S., but that was a non-starter. Then Secretary of State Dulles said that recognizing Soviet sovereignty in some northern islands would violate the Treaty of San Francisco because it would give the Soviet Union greater hand than the U.S., and then the U.S. may have to annex Okinawa. Then Hatoyama himself traveled to Moscow and said he'd resign from the PM position once diplomatic relations were re-established with the Soviet Union. The new issues ended up being 1. Ending the state of war, 2. Establishing diplomatic relations, 3. Repatriation of Japanese detainees, who were going through indoctrination at the time, 4. Fishing agreements, and five, Soviets letting Japan into the UN. In the agreement, territorial questions were deferred to later, which is a very nebulous later. A new peace treaty with the Soviet Union would have to happen before solving the island issues. Japan tried harder and asked for the islands of Habomai and Shikotan. They asked that those islands be returned after the agreement, and no, and, but no uh, further mention of territory occurred. The negotiation of this whole thing lasted 16 months, which was a very long time. The public reaction was overall negative uh, because not enough territory had been recovered. After Hatoyama resigned as prime minister, a more anti-Soviet administration took its place. So, how does this film express the Japanese national spirit? This movie depicts Japan, as I said, not only being a part of the international community, but leading the international community against the threats of the Mysterians. It reflects Japan's desire to play a more significant role and to have a rehabilitated role in the world community. So in a way, this is wish fulfillment, even though 1956 had seen uh, Japan rejoined the international community. The Mysterians represents Japan showing its best side and showing its willingness to participate and to, in fact, show what they're good for.
and how much leadership capabilities they really have and how much they can help the Earth. And Japan does this by what? Uh, thinking really hard, uh, inventing new things, and collaborating with others, including foreigners, which uh, are, includes uh, both of our English-speaking actors. Instead of us versus them, East versus West, it's instead us versus them, Earth versus the outsiders. It's a way to modify the formula of how to think about the world that we look at in 1956-57. Regarding economic figures of note, uh, we do not have any GDP figures until 1960, but I'm sure GDP was uh, going up plenty during this recovery period. This episode is dedicated to the great Takashi Shimura. He starred in this movie, the original Godzilla, and he has 270 other acting credits. He is known for his performances in Kurosawa films possibly the most. He acted in movies for nearly 50 years. Japanese classic cinema would not be what it is today without him. The next episode of this podcast will be 1958's Varan, or Daikaiju Varan. It is the only other black and white film that we'll be covering in season two. It has also been referred to as one of Honda's least effective works, but we have a lot going for it as well, in fact, because Shinichi Sekizawa was the one who wrote it. I'd like to send a shout-out to our patron, Sean Stiff. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Donating is really worth it. It's the inside track to what's going on with the show. What I'm doing at Kaiju Vision Radio is bringing this film appreciation to another level. Because these films, there's so much in them that is a lot better than a lot of people think. And so appreciating this film on this kind of a level is an important thing to do. It elevates the work, and it shows really why so many people are interested in them in the first place. If you'd like to send some feedback, I'd love to hear from you. The email address is feedback at kaijuvision.com. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter and on Facebook. Kaiju Vision Radio is available on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Podcast Addict, YouTube with scenic videos, and on kaijuvision.com. If you like the podcast, please donate on Patreon. I'm Brian Scherchel, and this is KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. See you next time.